Hello and welcome to another episode of Seed Speaks. My name is Sonia Begeman. I'm the editorial director here at Seed World Group. And I'm excited because today we're talking about something that I think is top of mind for many people. When you look at the world of agriculture, from farming to some of the most advanced sciences we see in breeding, there is so much data generated around the world. Well, the big question is, how do we take this massive amount of data and actually make it something that we can put into use? How do we make it something that helps inform decisions from the farm gate to the laboratory? Today, I'm joined by two fantastic experts. I'm joined by Jesse Gilsinger, who is BASF North America Soybean Breeding Lead. And I'm also joined by Steve Tanksley, who is Nature Source Improved Plants. And we're going to call that NSIP to shorten it up a little bit. Um, and he's the Chief Technology Officer for that group. So thank you guys both so much for joining me today. I think this is going to be a really fun and exciting conversation. Um, I think first, I'm going to ask each of you to tell us a little bit more about what you do. Now, Jesse, I know you've been involved in breeding for about a decade and a half now. Um, you've worked primarily with soybeans, but maybe talk to me about um, what BASF is doing. You know, we just talked about data collection being so important. What's maybe some of the things you're excited that you're doing right now and you're excited to see coming in the future for breeding? Yes, well, uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, certainly, uh, uh, an honor to be here and um, appreciate the the invite. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things going on uh, within within BASF right now. So globally, uh, we employ about a hundred thousand, uh, over a hundred thousand people globally, and of course, that's in agriculture, chemical manufacturing, nutrition, pharmaceuticals. Uh, specifically, I work as a North America soybean breeding manager and focus on developing elite commercial varieties for the North America market. Uh, but we also breed many other uh, crops as well, uh, including cotton, canola, wheat, and um, so things to be uh, really excited about right now. Um, when we look at um, uh, the amount of data that we generate for breeding trials on a daily basis, the, the technologies that we have now really allow us to, to manage that data in such a way that we couldn't do even five or 10 years ago. And at the end of the day, this really is going to enable us to make better, better predictions. So in breeding, uh, we're really in the prediction business. We wanna predict how a certain uh, combination of genetics is going to perform uh, on a on a farmer's field and being able to manage large data sets and collect that data uh, really puts us in a, in a good position to be able to make better products for the farmers um, and and ultimately which would benefit the consumer absolutely it's it's really exciting to think about how that data is coming into use for sure um, now, Steve, I've talked to you guys at NSIP before, and I know that you guys have this technology, this emerging science called um, operations research. And uh, we could talk about that the whole 30 minutes, but uh, we want to save time for questions too. So Steve, from a high level, can you tell me what operations research is and then why, you know, what your customers are seeing in terms of how it's helping, um, you know, narrow down breeding prospects to only the ones that will be most successful. Appreciate it. The um, operations research is a field that emerged out of computer science and uh, mathematics uh, several decades ago. And it, it's a way of using information to make decisions when the number of possible solutions for those decisions is enormous. And it became, um, in a practical sense, the underpinning of manufacturing and transportation. But only recently has it become part of the, of the plant breeding or breeding um, uh, situation. So what we have effectively have done at INSEP uh, is to take the tools of operations research and look at breeding as a manufacturing process, which it is. You're, you're manufacturing new varieties to product profiles or design specifications to meet uh, the grower's needs and the consumer's needs and the raw ingredients you have are genetic diversity and data. So we've looked at the entire pathway of steps and decision-making and breeding that determine outcomes and developed optimization algorithms based on operations research that both identify the minimum amount of data to make the optimal decision and also how to make the optimal decision so the outcome is uh, you can get higher gains uh, in your breeding program 
Uh, you can also uh, see faster returns. You get faster to market and you also uh, reduce R&D costs because you have less wastage in terms of data collection uh, and failed results. So in a nutshell, that's, that's what we do. We've worked on, I think, 15 or 16 different crops, including uh, field vegetable and uh, more recently orphan crops and, uh, and tropical crops. Now, um, you brought up an interesting point there, Steve, that I'm definitely going to ask more questions about orphan crops because I find that just to be a fascinating subject. But um, you mentioned you bring in together lots of different data points. Can you maybe talk to us about, um, obviously, every customer is different, but what in general are the data points that you really consider when you're doing operations research? Well, in today's era, when we have um, the advent of genomics, where we can actually look directly at the uh, DNA sequence and genetic variation, the raw ingredients are that, some type of genotyping, uh, phenotyping in a very selective way, so you're not spending any more resources than necessary to get the data, and then finally environmental data. In many cases, environmental factors are relevant for predicting performance in different environments. So those pieces of data come together. Uh, the challenge that I think the whole field of breeding and also life science faces now with the advent of tools to collect vast amounts of data is how do you actually judiciously collect the data and get a better decision out of it? And the risk is you get certain sort of enamored with large amounts of data, but you really don't make a process better. So we really focus on just getting the minimal amount of correct data to get the right decision uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting stuff and exciting to see how that's all coming together. Now, um, Jesse, from BASF's perspective, you know, you guys have just tons of different crops that you're looking at and tons of different pieces of data. Um, maybe talk to me, you know, as we've seen data quality evolve, what are those critical pieces of data today that maybe, you know, 15 years ago wouldn't have been as valuable because the data technology has advanced so much in our cloud computing and things like that. So what are, what are those critical data pieces today? Well, thanks, uh, Sonia, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, so growing up on a, on a farm uh, digging fence post holes, my dad would often hand me a shovel um, and tell me the hole is already there, you just have to get the dirt out of it. Uh, so it's, it's similar, I think, with data. The data is there. We just need to be able to observe, collect, and access that data uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. So uh, with that, a lot of these cloud technologies that, that have come about in the past five or 10 years not only gives us uh, more storage of large amounts of data, but also allows breeders uh, to access and link that data in, in much more efficient ways. Uh, so maybe just an example of that would be uh, we're able to now seamlessly link weather data uh, with our phenotypic data, for example. So when we think about the complexities of um, uh, trying to predict how a variety is going to do in a certain environment or a certain geography or, e or even in a, in, a, in a certain farmer's field, we can link this data now um, through different ways, through the cloud, through different platforms, through APIs. Uh, we can analyze all this data uh, in such a way that allows us to make make better predictions uh, so we can have better product placement uh, and make make better selections in breeding. So uh, many, many different advancements have, have certainly um, really allowed uh, breeders to to make uh, make make a lot of genetic gain. And we'll see uh, certainly see more of that coming here um, in the near future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Um, I've long talked to farmers and we always talk about it's genetics by environment, um, by management. And so, you know, when we look at breeding in a similar sense, you guys have to manage for all three of these factors. And so it's interesting to hear you talk about connecting weather data with your phenotypic data with some of that really important stuff. So um, you, you guys are thinking like farmers while you're breeding. And I, I for me, I, I'm from a farm family. I love hearing that to hear that perspective. Um, you know, I, I'm, I am curious. So um, we see it at the farm gate. We see it, you know, within your guys' operations too. Um, there's so much data. How is that data making you guys more efficient? You talked about how you can connect it all and things like that. But 
But where do we see that efficiency coming to, into play by having all of these additional data points? And, and Steve, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think the, it's, a, it's a good question. The data itself really doesn't have any value unless you get a better decision out of it in terms of selection or placement on the right environment. So what the um, Im important thing is to identify what is the actual subset of data that's critical for the decision making and how will that create a decision that gives you a better outcome. And that's been one of the, I think, limitations of this data rich period that we're in is often it's not really clear how the data or whether all the data should be used to get you to that next step. So the, the goal is to, to find the minimum amount of data that impacts the decision and to get a rapid decision made so you can move forward with a better outcome than you would have otherwise. And if you do that, you know, throughout the whole chain of breeding, it, it accumulates. And in the end, you have a better outcome. You can also get there more rapidly and also reduce the wastage and R&D cost. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesse, from your guys' perspective, you know, when you're breeding, you're breeding to find solutions for farmers and you're breeding to bring and commercialize a new product to market. So how is data helping you do that, you know, faster or better than before? Your audio is a little messed up, um, so you might have to mute one of those. Okay, how about now? Um, we'll go. We'll go for it. We can still understand you. We can still understand you. Go ahead. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties um, with you right now, Jesse. We'll have to come back to you on this question because it's kind of muting and and kind of coming in and out. So I'll I'll go to Steve for a second and we'll see if we can troubleshoot that on the on the the back end. So Steve, um, I'm curious. So you work with a lot of different breeding companies. Um, when you look at the data that you have available to you, mm -hmm. there is a lot, but we don't have everything. So what's a critical piece of data that you think is missing or a piece of data that you think will be here in the future that's going to make a huge difference? Yeah, I mean, and we, we do work with a lot of different organizations, ones that have been in business for decades and have very rich data sets going back many years. And obviously, those are the first things that we want to take advantage of is to get the best predictions and use out of that data. We also work with um, orphan crops in some cases where there's no data. You're just starting from ground zero. And in that case, you have to have to design as efficiently, quickly as possible how to get the data that you need to move the program forward. Uh, I can give one example from an orphan crop we work on, which is uh, castor uh, for castor oil. It really is an orphan crop. There are you know, no major companies working on breeding of castor, uh, no real historical data. So we had to put together uh, the germplasm collection, which we did very rapidly. A lot of it was publicly available. We uh, genotyped it, which is very um, economical. And based on that, we identified a core sample to go out for phenotyping to become a training set for phenotypic characters that can make predictions and uh, simultaneously, we did a multi-environment trial to start getting environmental prediction factors out of it. And all that happened in the course of about two or three years. So um, in cases where the data doesn't exist, I think the ability now is there to create the data to get programs going rapidly, which is one of the nice things. I think orphan crops are being very much enabled by this new era of uh, availability of data at a fairly economical price. Yeah, um, it's exciting, exciting to hear all of that. The The idea of an economical price really democratizes the use of data to make smarter breeding decisions, which means seed companies and countries of all sizes will have access to smart breeding in a way they never have before. Um, so really exciting stuff. All right, Jesse, let's see if your sound's any better, um, hopefully. Yeah, how's that? 
Oh my gosh, you sound wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Okay. So I'll have you address both of those questions for us, which is um, how is data making breeding more efficient? And then if you had like a magic wand and you could make any piece of data appear, what would that piece of data be to help your breeding? Yeah, so ex excellent questions. Um, as far as making breeding more efficient, what really has been a benefit in the last 10 years is the ability for uh, breeders to be able to seamlessly connect data across platforms. So uh, it used to be, you know, you'd have to go to the field and you would need to collect notes by hand and then upload those. Uh, now all this can be done automatically, uh, which is of course a huge time saver for the breeders. Um, you know, I think from a, what we would like to see um, is continued improvements in computing power. Uh, when we think about the soybean genome, for example, there's over 40,000 protein coding genes and they all interact with each other. All those genes interact with the environment. And when we're trying to predict performance, we have to understand how the interaction between all those components happen. Uh, so you can see really quickly that um, you end up with a very complex data set uh, but if we can manage that complexity and use that data to better predict the genetic combinations that will be maximized in a specific environment that the farmer uh, may have, uh, maybe a specific um, uh, you know, planting tillage method, fertilization program, climate, um, if we can use uh, very powerful computing to be able to predict that, um, that's definitely something that would enhance our ability to predict the variety performance in a farmer's field and then also um, lead to better product placement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we've had a couple questions come in from our audience, and I think that you guys will both be able to address both of these. Um, we'll start with one from Ashley Robinson. Um, and she said, you know, what kind of data, um, you know, May, might be being used right now in breeding that people don't realize is being used. Um, might be some arbitrary, like we use nematodes in soil or something like that. But what is a piece of data that people may not associate with um, breeding research that you guys are using on an everyday basis? And um, I'll start with you, Jesse. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I think that we use uh, a lot of different environmental uh, types of data that uh, that may not be familiar familiar with that we're actually using. So, uh, for example, a lot of the weather stations that we're using collect over 40 different weather parameters, and these can be things like solar uh, radiation uh, intensity, um, other types of um, uh, you know humidity, um, and other other data points. Uh, but really, we're using these in a way that will uh, allow us to merge that data with our genetic phenotypic and phenotypic data uh, so we can come up with really uh, better product placement um, types of uh, solutions for farmers. So uh, I think that's probably one thing that um, uh, many uh, people may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve, I know your clients come to you and they'll have a list of, you know, these are the parameters I want. These are the genetics I have. Um, maybe to kind of recast that question for you a little bit. Um, what's maybe the most interesting thing people have asked to be included in the process with you when it comes to operations research and finding the best candidate? Yeah, that's um interesting point. There's, there's sort of two areas where the data comes in. One is you know, if you're going to produce a variety to meet some uh, need in the market and succeed in the market, you have to very clearly define what characteristics and what levels it needs for that. So obviously you want to maximize yield, but there's often other uh, constraints in there, such as maturity time, protein content, disease resistance, etc. So the first thing that has to be done is to very carefully define those characteristics and what levelers are needed to when in the marketplace and meet the growers and consumers needs and then to have a an assay for actually measuring those it's one thing to say you want a certain characteristic but if you can never measure it you can't really make any improvements so that we spend a lot of time on that to make sure we have the minimum number of right characteristics in the product profile the design specifications and that we have in place phenotyping 
uh, systems that are both as economical as possible and as accurate as possible. And that differs in some crops we have up to, you know, 25 different characteristics we have to take care of and others maybe it's only five or 10. And the other is what Jesse said, the environmental data that goes in, which is especially important if you're trying to predict performance across environments or identify new environments and understand what varieties might work well on those. And I don't think people you know, probably recognize the extent of that data and the challenges with it. Uh, just speaking to the issue of computing power, which is one of the major transformers of breeding and, and biology, um, that also has become much more democratized than it was in the past. It used to be whether you were a pharma company or you know, a plant biotech company or whatever, you had to have very high investments in hardware for computing, and it made it difficult for smaller players to play. But cloud computing is pretty much level the playing field. Everyone can access the same amount of um, service, and it's very economical. So even the smallest companies can essentially have the same computing power as the largest companies. And we very much leverage that in our work because we develop the algorithms, but we require the computing power. And almost all of that's now done on the cloud. But what the breeder sees is basically a very straightforward interface that they work with. And behind the scenes, it's accessing all the cloud computing and algorithms to, uh, to do the work. You led really easily into my next question, which was this idea of how data and technology has democratized access to creating quality crops and quality, you know, genetics and things like that. So um, maybe from your perspective, Steve, you know, how has democratizing access to good breeding programs enabled farmers in maybe, um, you know, more impoverished communities and things like that? How is this going to enable people who normally wouldn't have access to any sort of quality control or just high quality product um, to, to have access to something specialized for their local area? That's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, th there's a large number of crops that underpin society, but only a small number have really been actively bred in a lot of investment, things like maize, soy, et cetera. And a lot of the other crops are highly valuable commodities or important locally and regionally for food substances, and they've had very little attention. Um, and the reason that the companies have not gone on and invested in these is that the cost of setting up the breeding and running it for these orphan crops really doesn't get the payback. But now when you have the cost of getting data and the speed much faster now, it becomes economical to do it. So for example, we have a papaya breeding program we run within our company. And it's, it's an orphan crop, but it's very important for those locations that produce it like in Mexico. And we're able to use the same tools in the same speed with which say maize breeding is being done. We're also working with a consortium of um, banana breeding, uh, especially in Africa, um, and taking our tools and applying that to uh, sort of fast forward the breeding of bananas, which has been a very slow process in the past for, for various number of reasons. So I think it makes it economically feasible to start putting resources into orphan crops where in the past it didn't make sense economically as a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really interesting stuff. Now, Jesse, I've heard you say a couple times, um, you know, that environment thing, you know, where we're creating localized solutions for farmers and things like that. And the thing is, like, BASF has always focused on localized solutions. And I know that for a fact, because, you know, you guys have been around for a long time, and you understand that part of agronomics. Um, I'm curious, though, it, it sounds like the data and the breeding that you're doing today is even more hyper-focused on local solutions than ever before. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how, how that's all working together? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, when we think about these very complex data sets now, um, we're really starting to implement a lot of machine learning. Uh, so what we're working on is developing algorithms that actually recognize patterns um, and uh, which patterns become increasingly important. So when we look at complex data sets, where we're looking at the phenotype, the genotype, and the environment, uh, we can learn the use these algorithms and machine learning to be able to better predict uh, which varieties were, uh, would be the best placed on a farmer's field. Uh, so this is really um, taking it to the next level. 
Uh, and when we think about another uh, aspect where we're starting to use a lot of things like multispectral imaging from UAVs, for example, this has really increased our data pool uh, by which we can generate whole new types of data, which we never really used before. Um, you know, the human eye is a, uh, quite an amazing thing, but we can see a lot of things with these multispectral cameras that we couldn't before. And we can match those data points uh, to different um, uh, phenotypic or genotypic uh, components uh, that really allow us to uh, better predict how these different genotypes will perform in, in an environment. Uh, so I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, developing uh, the right product for the right acre, uh, we're uh, definitely farther than we were, you know, five, 10 years ago and being able to, to do that. Um, and in the next, you know, 10 years, it's really gonna be exciting to see where this leads because the technology just keeps uh, improving uh, every day. Mm -hmm. Now we had another question come in from the audience. And I think you guys can both address this one because you'll have two different perspectives for sure. Um, and Alex asked, you know, you mentioned there's lots of data, but not all data is equal. We know that for sure. Some people don't have calibrated yield monitors, for example, and that can be pretty troubling or there's something off in the GPS, something has gone wrong. So how do you weed out the bad data from the useful data so that you're getting the most accurate representation possible? And I'll start with you on that, Steve. Yeah, that's obviously an important point because uh, you definitely don't want to use the bad data. What we typically do is start with available data that's maybe been present in a program, and we look at the data relevant to those traits that are in the design specification, and we ask how much genetic signal can be detected with that data, and that's measured by something like heritability. Um, if it's very low, it, it indicates that data is not very useful. It's not gonna have, have a very uh, high prediction. If that character is critical, we then go back and redesign the phenotyping to give back a better signal. Uh, the other thing we do is to weed out um, phenotypes and data that are basically measuring the same thing. And this happens quite often as that many, many traits will be collected at a cost and many of those are basically measuring the same thing. They have the same genetic signal. So you don't want to, to make the system more complex or more expensive by doing that. So we weed out essentially those traits and distill them down to one or two traits that are critical uh, for use. So that's, that's more how we look at data that's part of the design specifications for developing new varieties. And then I think probably Jesse can speak to the other part about the environmental data because there's obviously huge amounts of that data. And not all of that uh, becomes becomes useful in a model. Yeah, Jesse, can you maybe talk about environmental data or any other, you know, quote unquote, bad data you may have to weed out? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where, uh, once again, machine learning uh, is key, uh, where we train uh, the models to be able to identify what types of data are useful in achieving the, uh, the objective. Uh, so at the end of the day, if it's um, a trade or it's a piece of data that doesn't add value to the farmer or to the consumer, then of course, we're not interested in uh, pursuing that data. Uh, so really um, what we're uh, focusing on is, uh, is, is validating um, a lot of our models. That's a very important aspect of this. Uh, where we uh, will actually test uh, our models in the, in the fields and see if the predictions are accurate. Uh, and then we can make adjustments um, based on that. And uh, as we continue to uh, collect more and more data, that really helps sharpen our machine learning and allows us to make even better predictions. Mm -hmm. All right, well, this is a conversation that I think we could probably keep having for a long time because data has become such a huge part of our world from um, the fact that my smartphone has more memory than the first computer I ever had did to um, how it's being used in pharmaceuticals and agriculture. It is, it's an exciting future we have in store for sure. But in the interest of time, that is all the time that we have today. So thank you so much, Jesse and Steve, for joining me and giving me some great insights from two very different perspectives, but two perspectives who are ultimately trying to benefit the farmer by giving them the best product possible. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And stay tuned next week. Uh, you can join my colleague, Ashley Robinson, who's going to talk about robotics and uh, 
AI in agriculture. Uh, it's sure to be a really exciting topic, and I hope you'll join us. It'll be at noon central time, and uh, we'll see you next week.